Hi there, my name is Mike Conlon and I'm part of the Applied Snow and Avalanche Research Group at the University of Calgary. I'm here to discuss some of the snowpack tests that you can use to try to locate instabilities within the snowpack. I'll also briefly discuss which of these tests are useful to tell you uh, some insight into fracture initiation and which uh, tests are useful for uh, telling you information about the propagation potential of an initiated fracture. These are the tests that I'll be going through. I'll be showing how to prepare a compression test, deep tap test, extended column test, ruche block test, propagation saw test, shovel shear test, and a hand shear test. If you would like to only see one of these tests, please look at the description section below this video where I have listed the start times for each test within the video. I've listed approximate completion times for each test here. In general, they will take longer when first performing them, but they will become much quicker as you do more of them as the season goes on. First, here is a quick list of equipment that will be useful for performing and evaluating the tests. A shovel, probe, snow saw, ruler, ruche block cord, crystal screen, and a loop. You can get by with just a shovel and a probe for most of these tests, but the rest of this gear is light, inexpensive, and really helps to improve quality and speed the test up. Now I will walk through the snowpack tests. So starting out with the compression test. The compression test stems from the 1970s where it was used by Parks Canada wardens. It is an effective test at locating instabilities near the surface of the snowpack. A column of 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters is isolated in the snowpack with a typical depth of approximately 100 to 120 centimeters. When on an incline, the 30 centimeters is measured upslope, not horizontal. To start, a pit must be dug downslope of where the compression test is to be completed. The back wall of the pit should be vertical. The column can then be formed. There are many ways to create a nice, uniform column, but I will go through my usual methodology. I typically start by exposing one side of the column by sawing upslope and shoveling away the snow, just enough so that I have room to reach in for the back cut of the column. I then measure 30 centimeters across and cut the other side of the column. I remove a wedge of snow here for better viewing and to ensure that the column is fully isolated by visually seeing the saw as I do the back cut. I then measure 30 centimeters upslope and cut the back of the column. Once the column is formed, place the shovel on the surface of the column and begin by tapping 10 times with your fingertips, moving your hand from your wrist. Stop for any fractures that occur and mark them as easy and note the fracture character. Here I am measuring the depth to a progressive compression fracture. Continue until 10 easy taps are complete. Although not obvious, I am only touching the shovel blade with my fingertips. Once the 10 easy taps are completed, level the remainder of the column so that it is flat. This is to pass the remainder of the applied stresses vertically through the column. Now tap 10 more times with your fingertips as I am doing here, or your knuckles, but moving your arm from your elbow. These taps should be harder than the easy taps, but they should not be so hard that your hand or knuckles hurt. Record any fractures that occur and mark them as moderate. Level the column again if it is not horizontal. Complete the test by tapping 10 more times with your open hand or fist, moving your arm from your shoulder. Watch out for fractures that occur because your shovel passed through the layer at the back of the column. These should not be recorded. You should only remove release blocks of snow if they can't be placed back onto the column and support further taps evenly. Again, these hard taps should be harder than the moderate taps but not so hard that your hand hurts at the end. Record the number of taps to create any fracture as hard and note the fracture character. To recap, the compression test score should be recorded as shown here. If it fails on isolation of the column, it is CTV. If a layer fails between 1 to 10 taps, it is CTE. 11 to 20 taps, CTM. 21 to 30, CTH. And if the layer does not fracture, then it is CTN. As for the fracture character of a fractured layer, it is recorded as either sudden planar, sudden collapse, progressive compression, resistant planar, or a non-planar break. I highly suggest you watch the video with the link shown here as it goes through each fracture character type in detail with examples for each. This will give you a better feel as to how to interpret the results from the compression test. 
Now we'll look at the deep tap test. The deep tap test is similar to the compression test, but it is only an analysis of a persistent weak layer relatively deep within the snowpack where the compression test is not effective. The snow above the persistent weak layer should be at least one finger hardness. The test is conducted by isolating a 30 cm by 30 cm column in the snowpack, like the compression test. Only 15 cm of snow above the weak layer, as measured from the back of the column, should be kept for this test. To set up the test, first isolate a column, similar to a compression test. In fact, the same column as a preceding compression test can be used if the column was not disturbed around the weak layer of interest. The only tricky part is measuring the 15 cm above the persistent weak layer. I typically use my crystal screen to measure this. I then use my snow saw to cut the horizontal top surface. I then remove the snow above, exposing my test surface. Note that the back of the column only needs to be cut to a few centimeters below the weak layer of interest. Once isolated, the user continues in the same fashion as the compression test, beginning by doing 10 easy taps from the wrist with your fingertips. Next, the user does 10 moderate taps from the elbow. Although not obvious with my glove here, the taps are using your fingertips or your knuckles if you prefer. Finally, 10 hard taps from the shoulder are completed with your open hand or fist. It may be difficult to determine if the layer has released. You can check this by gently wiggling the test column. For this test, you only stop once the weak layer of interest fractures. In this case, the weak layer of interest did not fracture, so it was recorded as DTN. Here is an example of a deep tap test fracturing in the moderate range, and it was recorded as DTM with a sudden planar fracture character. To recap, if the column releases upon isolation of the column, it is recorded as DTV. If it is released in the first 10 steps, it is recorded as DTE for deep tap easy. Between 11 to 20 taps is DTM, 21 to 30 taps is DTH, and if the layer does not fracture, it is recorded as DTN. The same fracture character as the compression tests are used. Again, I highly suggest watching the video listed here. And now the extended column test. The extended column test is relatively new, developed in Colorado and New Zealand around 2006. It is similar to the compression test, but is conducted on an isolated column that measures 90 centimeters across slope by 30 centimeters upslope. This added cross slope length provides more information on fra fracture propagation potential than the compression test. The column depth should be at greatest 100 centimeters, as this test rarely affects deeper layers. To set up this test, a pit should first be dug downslope of where the test is to be conducted. The column can be isolated using two probes and a ruche block cord, or in this case, only one probe is required because we are digging out one of the sides of the column for better viewing of the test. This test is easiest to conduct when two people are present and you have a ruche block cord. You can place your probe in the upper corner of the column section and use the ruche block cord as a saw to isolate the column. Otherwise, a saw can be attached to a ski pole and used to isolate the back with a vertical cut. If the snow surface is hard and on an incline, the top portion of snow should be removed to make the snow surface horizontal on one end of the column where the taps will be completed. Once the column is isolated, the same tapping steps as the compression test should be completed. Start with 10 light taps using your fingertips, moving your hand from the wrist. Level the column to horizontal if it is not already. Continue with 10 moderate taps, moving your arm from the elbow, using your fingertips as I do here, or your knuckles if you prefer. Record any fractures as they occur. It is helpful to have a second person watching the test, such as my colleague Simon here, as it can be difficult to locate fractures while tapping from above. Finish the test by conducting 10 hard taps from the shoulder. Fractures should be recorded as they occur within the test. Again, watch out for fractures that initiated because your shovel passed through the layer at the back of the column. For this test, some fractures may occur only below the shovel and some may occur across the entire length of the column. These observations are important and are recorded within this test as follows. The result is recorded as ECTPV if the fracture propagates across the entire column during isolation of the column. The result is recorded as ECTP followed by the number of taps 
if the fracture propagates across the entire column on the tap number or the tap following the initiation of the fracture below the shovel. The result is recorded as ECTN followed by the number of taps. If the fracture was observed below the shovel but it did not propagate across the entire column on the tap number or the tap following the initiation of the fracture below the shovel. The result is also ECTN followed by the number of taps if the fracture only propagates across part of the column on the number or number plus one tap or if it takes more than one additional loading step to propagate across the entire column. Finally, the result is recorded as ECTX if no fracture was observed during the test. Now we'll be performing a Rouge Block test. The Rouge Block test is one of the oldest snowpack tests developed by the Swiss in the 1960s. The procedure is slightly different in North America and Europe, and I will explain the North American steps. A Rouge Block test should be performed on a slope of at least 25 degrees and preferably 30 degrees or steeper. For this test, a block of snow of approximately 2 meters wide by 1.5 meters upslope is isolated. If you dig out the two sides of the Rouge Block, then 2 meters across is correct. However, if you are using a long saw or Rouge Block cord to isolate the column such as in this photo, the lower edge should be 2.1 meters and the upper edge should be 1.9 meters, creating a trapezoid. This is to ensure that the block does not get caught up on the sides if it releases. The depth of the column should reach below any active weak layer of interest. Like the other tests, we begin by creating a snow pit with a vertical back wall. This pit should be approximately 1.5 meters deep for a Rouge Block test. Once the lower pit is dug out, mark the lower width on the snow where the test will be performed, as I do here with my ruler. Then continue to measure the dimensions of the block of snow. Next, we isolate the column. A Rouge Block cord works well when the snow is soft to moderately hard. In this instance, two probes are placed vertically in the snow on both upper corners and the cord is placed around the probes and two users work together to saw the snow with this cord. If harder snow or thin hard crusts are present in the snowpack, cords can get caught up on the hard interfaces. Complete isolation with shoveling or long snow saws work best for these snowpack types. A ski pole with the baskets removed or the tail of a ski also work for Rouge Blocks up to approximately 60 centimeters in depth in soft to moderately hard snow. Here we remove the snow on one of the sides of the test so that we get a good visual of any fractures that may occur and any displacement of the snow. Once the block is isolated, the test begins with varying loading steps. A Rouge Block score of 1 occurs when the block slides during isolation of the block. A score of 2 occurs when the tester gently steps down onto the upper part of the block within 35 centimeters of the, of the upper wall. If the block releases, this is a score of 2. If it does not release, the tester next drops from straight legs to bent knee position without lifting their heels, which would be score of 3 if it releases. If not, the tester then jumps up and lands in the same compacted spot. This would be a score of 4 if the block releases. If nothing happens, the tester then jumps again onto the same compacted spot, and this would be a score of 5. Otherwise, there are then differing steps depending on the slab hardness or depth of the active weak layer. If the slab is hard or deep, the user removes their skis or snowboards and jumps in the same spot. For softer or thinner slabs, where this may penetrate the weak layer, the user keeps their skis on and steps down another 35 centimeters to almost mid-block and pushes once and jumps three times. This entire step is classified as a score of 6 if it releases during any of the loading steps. If the block does not slide during the entirety of these loading steps, the score is 7. The 7 steps are listed here again. They are also listed in the Observation Guidelines and Recording Standards for Weather, Snowpack and Avalanches, published by the Canadian Avalanche Association. For reporting a Rouge Block result, the release type is also noted. A whole block is listed if 90 to 100 percent of the block releases. Most of block is recorded if 50 to 80 percent of the block releases. Finally, edge of block is recorded if 10 to 40 percent of the block releases on a planar surface. Here I'll be explaining the propagation saw test. The propagation saw test is a recently developed test by the Applied Snow and Avalanche Research Group at the University of Calgary. This test only analyzes the propagation propensity of a persistent weak layer. 
For this test, a column 30 cm across by 100 cm or greater upslope is isolated. The upslope length of 100 cm is used when the weak layer of interest is buried 100 cm or less in depth. For the example shown, the weak layer was only 50 cm deep, so the length of the column is 100 cm. However, if the persistent weak layer is deeper than 100 cm, the length of the column is the same as the vertical depth to the weak layer. For this example, the weak layer was 150 cm deep, so the length of the column equals that at 150 cm. Here I show how to isolate a shallow column. I first locate the weak layer and mark it. I then measure the 100 cm upslope length of the column and use my saw to cut both the top and bottom of the column. I then dig the bottom out. I measure the 30 cm cross slope along the length of the column and subsequently use my saw to cut the back edge of the column, fully isolating it. Note that this can only be done with a snow saw when the persistent weak layer is shallow enough that your saw completely passes through it. If the weak layer is deeper, it is easiest to conduct using two people, a probe in the back corner, and a ruche block cord, as shown here with Simon. Now, a snow saw is used to artificially fracture the weak layer of interest. The blunt edge of the saw is used and it is passed up through the weak layer at a speed of 10 to 20 centimeters per second until the fracture propagates ahead of the saw. At this point, the test is complete and the point in which the fracture propagated should be noted. Three results may occur with the propagating fracture. First, the fracture may propagate to the end of the column and is classified as end. This was the result of the test I just showed. Second, the fracture may propagate to a point in which it is interrupted and stops at a slab fracture that forms within the overlying slab. This is classified as SF for slab fracture. Lastly, the fracture may propagate but self-arrest somewhere within the weak layer before reaching the end of the column. This is classified as ARR for self-arrest. To record your results, the cut length and the total column length are recorded, along with the propagation release type. For this example, where the fracture propagated to the end of the column, the cut length was 38 cm and the total column was 104 cm. The result is recorded as 38 over 104 end. To interpret the results, propagation is deemed likely if the cut length is less than 50% of the column and the propagating fracture reaches the end of the column. Any other result within the test is deemed to have a low propagation potential. Here are a couple notes that you must keep in mind while performing this test. For the dragging of the saw, take time to ensure that your saw is following the weak layer and that the saw completely passes through the 30 cm width of the column. Some snow saws are only approximately 30 cm in length, so the use of a longer saw is very helpful. Once the test is complete, remove the block and ensure that your saw penetrated the wall behind the test column. If the saw did not completely pass through the weak layer during the test, it should be repeated. If multiple layers are of interest in the isolated column, start by testing the bottommost layer and working up. This provides less possibility of breaking or affecting the column as the tests are performed. Looking at the weak layers is often easiest after performing many of these snowpack tests. Simply scrape your crystal screen on the exposed surface and analyze them with your loop. Now we'll go into a shovel shear test. The shovel shear test provides information about where in a snowpack a shear fracture could occur and provides a qualitative assessment of the strength of the weak layer. The test is conducted on a column area of 25 cm across and 35 cm upslope. The column should have a depth of about 70 cm. To conduct a shovel shear test, you first need to dig a pit to expose the snow where the test will be conducted. Any snow that is fist to forefinger hand hardness should be removed from the area above where the column will be. An area of 25 cm across and 35 cm upslope should be marked. Completely remove the snow from one side of the column and cut a small wedge on the other side. Vertically cut the back edge of the column ending in medium hard to hard snow leaving the saw at the bottom as a reference. If your shovel has a bend in it, Remove a wedge of snow near the surface to allow your shovel to enter behind the column without applying pressure. Now place your shovel behind the column and pull the column in the downslope direction with both hands on the shovel. If a clean shear fracture occurs within the isolated portion of the column, as it did in this test, mark the depth of the shear on the back wall. 
If no fracture is observed, an irregular fracture occurs, or a clean fracture occurs at the saw, repeat the previous steps on deeper snow. If a clean shear fracture occurred, repeat the test on a second column, but this time with the edge of the shovel placed approximately 10 to 20 centimeters above the sheared layer. Mark the depth of the layer and the approximate effort necessary to shear the snow. Note whether it fractured very easy, easy, moderate, hard, or if no fracture occurred. If the failure planes of the two tests were different, repeat the test. Finally, observe the crystal shape and size at the failure plane, which is typically easy to obtain from the underside of the release block. And finally, I'll be looking at a hand shear test. The hand shear test is a very simplified version of the shovel shear test and only provides a rough qualitative assessment of shallow weak layers or interfaces. It is performed by isolating a block of approximately 30 cm by 30 cm by about 40 cm in depth. It is an easy test to perform while you are re recreating in the backcountry. Start by exposing a portion of snow about 40 to 50 cm in depth. The bottom edge should be dug out enough to allow for the block to slide. Next, isolate the column using your hand or your ski pole in a sawing motion. Again, no deeper than about 40 centimeters. Once isolated, place your hand behind the column and pull on it in a slope parallel direction. Note any fractures that occur and how easily or hard you had to apply pressure to cause them. Note the amount of force required to fracture as easy, moderate, or hard. Visually look at the block to note if there were planar fractures and also look for any large crystals that may be of interest. This test is quite subjective and should be combined with other snowpack tests. To summarize, we looked at the snowpack tests listed here. Some of these are good for information on fracture initiation, some are good for fracture propagation, and some are good for both. Fracture initiation provides you information on creating an initial fracture within a weak layer or interface in the snowpack. Fracture propagation provides you information on the likelihood of an already initiated fracture of propagating across a larger area. Both initiation and propagation are required to release a slab avalanche. Tests that provide good information on fractured initiation include the compression test, the extended column test, and the Rouge block test. Tests that provide the best information on fracture propagation include the propagation saw test and the extended column test. For all of these tests, the fracture character and release type should be analyzed as much as the number of loading steps, as valuable information is obtained from them. And finally, I'd just like to note that all of these snowpack tests are at a scale much smaller than an avalanche, and therefore conducting multiple tests across an area could tell you uh, quite a bit more information than just one test alone. And for performing these tests, expert site selection is important because if you're performing these tests on an area that is not representative of where you're recreating, then it may not be telling you useful information. And finally, um, it should be noted that stability tests should give you information as to why to not go to an area, why you shouldn't recreate on a slope, and it should never be used uh, to give you absolute information that an area is safe to be on. Thank you very much.